Well, hello, neighbor. Today, we're going to be talking about a new disease that's out there in the world about strawberries. We're going to try to give you a little information that you can use on this right here. I think a lot of misinformation is out there, so we're going to try to clarify some of that. And guess what? At the end of the show, we're going to announce the Hossinator winner. Welcome to the Road by Road Gardening Show, the best dead gum gardening show on the internet, where we talk about gardening, a little bit of cooking, and growing your own food. Now sit back and enjoy. Well, strawberries are going to be for next month, and we've been getting a lot of customer service emails about a new disease. And I say new, I'm using all, all this uh, loosely here. And the I'm going to let you see if you can pronounce it. Uh, this new disease is called... You want to give it a shot? Neopestalopsis. Yeah, that's the way I would have said it too, but that's not necessarily. Just, just, we'll just throw it up on screen. Yeah, we're going to throw it on screen. <laughs> Neo, Neopelos, I had it down before I sat down here. I had it pretty good because I practiced this. Neopestalopsis. Folks, that's about as good as I can do. But anyway, this disease right here is getting a lot of press right now. And... Uh, there's some good reason behind that, but I feel like there's some misinformation out there. We've been in conversations with path pathologists with UGA, got some clarification on some things. I actually talked to our grower. I got some more of my questions answered, so we're going to dig into that. But we got beautiful zinnias, folks. Look at there. I planted these in your poche garden. Mm -hmm. yep. some, of them, some of them volunteered. Mm -hmm. I've got another batch coming on. Yep. Had a little worm problem with them. Had a little worm problem we had to take care of. But I think it's taken care of. And folks, I want y'all to look at this right here. You know, we told you last week about our Roselle. Uh, this right here is really amazing to be put on this many calyxes this early in the year. So we know, or we think, we don't know anything, but we think this variety is going to be way earlier maturing, which is going to be great for most people, including us. The thing about them, the calyx is not as big as, as I was told they would get. So the calyx are a little bit smaller than what we They might be the drought. I've kept them watered. I, maybe I planted them too close together. I don't know. But the yeah, calyx yeah, seem to be a, a little bit small there. But hopefully we're going to have a good seed crop. But I can tell you this, I believe with this variety right here, people all over the state of Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana can grow this particular variety right here where the other variety we had – you couldn't grow it in North Georgia. But this one, I believe you can. I believe this one matures out on what we call dazed maturity. The other one, the thigh red variety we had, it matured out on length of day in the day. So, so did you pull up every one, other one like I, I asked you to? I did. I think your rows is too close together. I think too. it may be a little close together. I got because you can't walk between them. Can't walk between them, but I got I got some nice looking bushes. But it may be. But I was told early on the calyx is a lot bigger. We'll see. This may be the first ones, but just look at how they loaded up. Now, according to me, to my memory, this is produces a lot more than the other one did. Yeah. Look yeah. at the amount of calyx is one, yeah. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And I took some. Stem. I took some off the bottom to put yeah. it in water. Right. Now, these down here is already bloomed. Mm -hmm. If you don't know what Roselle is, you can you can do a, a search on there. It's an edible hibiscus that we love to grow, and we've been excited about this new variety because uh, we've had a lot of problems with it maturing out. So that's still got a lot of maturing to do. So this this calyx is going to continue to grow until that seed pod gets bigger. Show everybody the seed pod in there. Now, if you're going to save your seeds on this, which if you was lucky enough to get some of these seeds that we sent out earlier in the spring make certain you save your seeds because this variety right here is extremely rare and hard to get. To save these seeds, your seed pot is right inside right here and you want to let that mature out and it'll actually pop up. When it first yeah. pop up, pops open is when you want to harvest those seeds, not before then. Yeah. Mm. Yep. I'll so, it. Yeah. Rosie. Tart. Little tart ant. Good we got the hostinator winter we're going to do and then show so, uh, had a lot of entries, a lot of big hostinators, but uh, we got a winner from the spring hostinator challenge out there. So let's talk about strawberries. So this disease that we've been hearing a lot about, we've had, man, we've had calls and uh, I don't, I knew the information was out there and it was widespread. So this particular pathogen has been around for a while. It was a, it was 
first seen in Florida back in the early 70s. However, it got a name change a couple of years ago, and it's, it raised its ugly head again a year ago. It is a leaf spot and a fruit rot. It can go both ways on things. It can cause leaf spot just like you would with any other natural occurring leaf spot. And if you've grown strawberries in the past, you know we always have problems with leaf spot on strawberries. This particular one, you actually kind of have to look at it under a microscope to be able to identify that it's this particular disease versus a normal leaf spot. And then we can also get fruit rot on the fruits as well when they start maturing out. Now, we got other diseases as well that cause that. Fruit, fruit blotch, we got anthracnose. There's a whole host of uh, diseases that get on strawberries, and some of them look real similar. So my point is, it's going to be nearly impossible for the home gardener or maybe the small farmer to identify this right here. You probably have to have it identified in a, in a lab to get a proper diagnosis on it. So this pathogen has been around for a long time, got renamed a couple, three years ago, and uh, started seeing more of it three years ago, and then last year was more, and this year it seems to be even worse. Now, that being said, there are some disease-resistant varieties out there. The most, uh, the, the most cultivars or uh, what I, varieties, the most varieties that are most acceptable to this right here is some of the varieties that are commercially grown in Florida that we don't sell. All three of our varieties are somewhat resistant. Now, I'm using that term lightly, but they have shown in studies not to get it as bad as some of the newer varieties that's commercially grown in Florida. And uh, we got Camarasso, and what was we got? Chandler Camarasso, what's the other one? Anyway, Chandler is probably, I seen a graph on this today, Chandler is probably the least, and there wasn't much difference in this research, Chandler uh, didn't have quite as much resistance as the other two did, but it was pretty high on scale there. So we got that going for us. Can so you treat it? You can treat it, and that's going to be part of the problem and we'll get to here in just a minute. Uh -huh. So this, uh, most of our tips comes out of Canada. Believe it or not, lips to your plants come out of Canada. And this, they have found some infected plants in Canada before. Therefore, it's growing to our growers and it's showing back up. Now, I talked to our grower last week and this is what he told me. He said, as of this moment right here, he was clean. But he said, I expect that to change. And after talking to the pathologist at the University of Georgia, you made a good point here and I'll pass this along to you. You should assume that any plants that you get has been exposed or may be infected from this particular pathogen here. That's the best way to go about it. This is going to be something we have to deal with. This is not something that's going to blow in here and blow out in one year's time and it's going to be gone. This is something we're going to have to deal with from here on. But you know what? We've dealt with these diseases before and we will overcome. You can treat it. There's some problems along the way with that, but it is treatable with fungicides. Some people say, well, it gets into your soil system and it lives forever. Well, that very well may be true. We got a world of pathogens that lives in our soil system forever. Uh, Pythium, we got all kind of bad pathogens that cause disease problems, but we manage those. And that's the way we're going to have to manage this particular disease right here. Now, uh, the Treatment for this is going to be a fungicide treatment, and I'm I'm working on this as we speak here. I'm having some conversations with the uh, universities trying to figure out what we're going to do there. There is a couple of uh, fungicides that's going to be available to the homeowner that's going to be able to use in a rotation. One of them is chlorothionyl. We sell that one as our fruit and vegetable disease spray. Chlorothionyl has been around for a long time. It's a great protective spray. Another one that we don't care that we may pick up and care pretty soon is propiconazole. I know that don't mean much to y'all, but propiconazole is a good systemic fungicide that's been around for a while. It's used in the vegetable industry a lot. It has some activity on this well. And another one is Manab or Manzate that's been around forever. Man, when I first started in my early 20s, we used Manab back then. It has some activity on it as well. Those three fungicides are available to the home gardener. The problem was that they're not labeled for strawberries. I think that's going to change. I think the uh, Department of USDA or whoever does the labeling on these chemicals are going to give us some exemptions on that for the home gardener. That's just my looking into my eight ball there telling you what I think. We're working on getting you guys a 
app, a fungicide schedule to combat this right here. And the great thing is, it's going to combat these other diseases anyway. So you really should be spraying your strawberries anyway because they're prone to the, all these other diseases. Alternaria, there's a bunch of them out there. So this is really not going to be any different. We may kind of have to change up on our fungicides a little bit. So there we have that. Now one of the one of the problems that we're going to see is trying to grow these strawberries organically is going to be a big issue this year, but that's always a big issue anyway. So if you're trying to grow strawberries organically, you're going to have a major, major problems not, not uh, treating these with these fungicides. However, I was told they do not see this disease in hoop houses. Huh. Wonder why. Well, the, the theory, and all this is theory because there's not much known about this disease. Even the experts will readily admit that. They think it's moved by the wind and the hoop house somewhere mm -hmm. protects that right there. But they said they, they grow fine, strawberries fine in hoop houses without, uh, without this particular disease and probably other diseases as well. So hoop houses are what we, what we call controlled environmental agriculture where there's these big Greenhouses that grow things inside. There's a lot of those now. Is that like a high tunnel? Yep, high tunnel or either of these big greenhouses. So uh, those work without very little, if any, disease pressure. They found that interesting. A um, lot of misinformation out there. Not a lot of good information out there. They still don't know much about this disease. Evidently, there's different strains of it. There's weaker strains and there's more uh, aggressive strains to it. But I guess the whole point is, this is something we're going to have to deal with. Don't fret it a whole lot. Don't think that if you don't grow strawberries this year, you do not have this problem next year or the year after. This is something we're going to have to live with this year to stay. The way they think this thing got spread, now this is, these are always theories, mm -hmm. is, I so said, we had it in Florida. Hurricane come through, picked it up in the wind, carried it all the way to Canada, <laughs> and infected some of the... Uh, plants in Canada where we get our tips from. Now that being said, if a hurricane can move it from Florida to Canada through the wind, it's going to be everywhere. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot we can do about it. Now, uh, as far as uh, USDA and Department of Agriculture do what they call quarantine sometimes. But they're not putting a quarantine on any of this right here that I'm aware of because I asked this question the other day. So that tells me that the USDA and Department of Agriculture have kind of thrown their hands up and said it's not going to do any good to doing quarantines. If they thought they could solve the problems with quarantines, I could promise you that would be done. But we're not seeing any quarantines. So we're just going to have to deal with it. Don't let it scare you a whole lot. We're going to have to grow our strawberries. We're going to, have to treat our strawberries. And from a home gardener standpoint, you're going to be in better shape than the commercial guys are from a standpoint is you don't have as many strawberries to tend to. And you can probably get by a little bit better than the commercial guys. Commercial guys are really going to have to stick to a, a pretty strict program. I am recommending that or going to recommend that for the home gardener as well. But there we have it. I think growing in some of these things like um, the um, green, stock. green stock may help because you don't have a lot of... Uh, you have good drainage there and it's kind of separated out. So that may work. Uh, we'll see how it goes. But my point is don't fret a lot about it. Be aware of it and move on. It's kind of where we had on strawberries. We still got strawberries on the website? Still got strawberries on the website. And uh, I'm staying in touch with our grower. And he's giving me good information. I'm, weekly we have conversations about that. And... Uh, he he did ex he did tell me he expected to see it, and like I said, the the guy from UGA said, and I, this was profound. What he said was, "You should assume that you got it, because everybody's gonna have it." Just so, put it on a treatment schedule. Just prove and just go with it. I don't think being scared of it. I think learning how to deal with it's gonna be better than being scared of it. So. Anybody's got anything else to add, or you disagree with me on some of it? By all means, let me know. But there's not a lot of information out there. There is a uh, small fruit and vegetable out of uh, Alabama Association that does a lot of work with this right here. They're probably the forefront on the research of that. And those guys is probably with it. The, they're, they're in touch with your universities and they're getting a lot of good information out there. But um, that's pretty much where it's at. And you know, another thing, you're going to find this interesting. You know what something, and our girl is actually doing this now, this kind of, some people say it doesn't work. Some people say it doesn't. Peroxide. 
peroxide. Spray and peroxide on them. Hmm. For a fungus? Mm -hmm. Think about it. It's a it's sanitation. I mean, it's, it's going to kill. It could kill on contact. Now, there is some, uh, I've seen an article from Clemson University. They said it didn't do any good, but a lot of you uh, universities are recommending that. Uh, there's a particular call, product called Oxidate, but it is hydrogen peroxide. And you can spray it. And I know our grower, he told me he was using it, trying yeah. to stay clean. That so. is interesting. Next month, we'll have them in. Hopefully, everything looks good and uh, kind of go from there. If you need some strawberry plants, let us know. We've got some big growers going to come by and pick them up. So if you're going to order a lot of them, and uh, you may want to come pick yours up because they don't ship well. If we had to ship them LTL, now if we ship them UPS, it's not bad at all. They get in there in two or three days' time. But these large shipments on LTL, we don't like to do that. So we're telling our larger growers just to make plans to come pick them up when they come in. Mm -hmm. All right, there we have that. Something more positive. Let's talk about a little more positive. You know too? Yeah. Hossinator. Look at there, folks. And the winner is, put my glasses on, Jerry and Sharon Glitch. Um, they are from, what did I say? <laughs> 1.71 pounds. Look at there. They got their picture of the Hoss Nader pack right there. That's large. We had a lot of large entries. Mm-hmm. But this one right here came out on winter. Some people had one, maybe one or two larger that they posted after we posted this on our Facebook group, but they didn't enter it. So this yeah. was the winning entry right here. They said they actually had one that was 1.8 pounds and they accidentally deleted the picture. Ah. Uh, but they still won. I want to show everybody, uh, if you want to know a telltale sign of how you can tell this is a hallucinator, if you look at what they call the scar bloom right there, you see that right there? You can look at that right there, and the, the, the hallucinator is known to have that scar bloom right there. Now, some of you commercial people complain a little bit about it, but anyhow, you have a large type tomato like the hallucinator, you're going to have that right there. And when I see that scar bloom right there, that's a telltale sign to me that it is a hallucinator. So, I'll let pass that a little bit along. That can be, from a breeder standpoint, that's not necessarily a good thing. Please don't bother this for Oh, oh, there it goes. On my next page. Zone 9A, Molina, Florida. Molina, Florida, yep. Sharon, Jerry and Sharon, yep. Yeah, the Hostinators were the workhorse of the garden this year. Thank you for all you do for Backyard Gardeners. And if, uh, has she already contacted them? I think so. But they want a $100 gift certificate. Yep. House. Speaking of tomatoes, look at our garden spotlight of the week right here. Matt Goforth sent this in. This is his son, Cooper, with his second picking of the Florida 91s we grew from y'all seeds. Thank you. Well, Matt and Cooper, y'all did a wonderful job. Ain't them some pretty tomatoes mm -hmm. right there? Now, Florida 91, if you didn't know it, is a good heat set variety. And I've got two varieties. And they're from Benton, Tennessee. Benton, Tennessee. I'm going to show Cooper one more time because he's proud of himself and he ought to be. Dead damn it. All right, uh, I've got a couple experimental varieties I grew for this fall out in the garden. <laughs> it's okay, I'm, we're going to do something on them later. But I had one right beside the other one, and uh, both of them were indeterminate types. One of them turned out to be a heat set type, and one of them was not. I got one row that is loaded, the next row don't have any tomatoes on there. Well, you think to yourself, why is that? It was simply because it's not a heat set type. They will, some of these tomatoes will not set in, in extreme heat. It's been hot still. Like we've had. So it's a good thing if you're going to grow a late crop, make sure you get a good heat set variety. Florida 91 is a good heat set variety, and the Hossinator is a heat set variety as well. So here we have it. All right, folks, on the... Uh, how about the old goat? Old goat, is he somewhere on the set? He's moving around, ain't he? Mm -hmm. This week's winner from the old goat is Benny3118. That's the username on YouTube. So yep. send us an email to support at growhoss.com and we will get you some good dirty socks in the mail. Look at there, Benny. Oh, you're going to be talking to town, strutting around with them on. Yep, pull them around, pull them up high, but wear them proud. <laughs> All right, I'm going to show this right here real quick, and we're going to get out of here. 
Folks, got some Brussels sprouts going on. These rings right here are less than a week old. Got them coming up there, and you can tell they are planted more than one seed in there because these seeds are small. We'll go in there and just pull some of them out. I'll take my pocket knife sometimes and go in there and clip them off. But seven days time, we got these right here. These will be putting on the true leaves in a day or two. I'll hit them with a little juice, get them popping. Brussels sprouts. had not grown any in a little while, but we're going to grow a good crop of them this year. It may become Maybe. springtime. We'll have some Brussels sprouts. <laughs> you think it'll take all winter? It takes forever for them things. Yeah. It, does, it shows on the pack about 100, 100 days or so to maturity, but they test my patience every year. But we love them. If you don't like Brussels sprouts, you never eat them fresh. Now, I don't like them out of the store, the can, and all that, but fresh Brussels fresh. sprouts, cut in half, cut in half roasted. Good. All right, folks. Thank you for joining us. Hope we clarify some strawberry issues for you today. We've got more information coming out on that. We're working on a good fungicide program and uh, maybe getting it approved with the USDA or maybe get some exemptions done so we can get you some solutions out there. I think it's probably going to, if we keep them sprayed, I think we're probably going to make a good crop. We just got to do our due diligence in growing strawberries. And they're just prone to disease. And this is just one more we're going to have to learn to live with. Thanks for joining us. Get outside and get those hands dirty.